Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So we have been talking about verifying identities. We've already covered some identities that we can use that are equivalent, all right? For example, that sine and one over cosecant are equivalent because they're reciprocal. Today we're going to cover a few more identities. The first set are some co-function identities that we talked about way back at the beginning of the semester. So if you have the sine of pi over 2 minus x, all right? So that means 90 minus x. As a side note, pi over 2 minus x is really equivalent to the complement, all right? We talked about complementary and supplementary angles again at the start of the semester. So basically, if you take the sine of the complement of an angle, that has to be the cosine of just the angle itself, all right? Because you're basically talking about the other angle in the triangle, and so you're switching from your opposite to adjacent, and switching from opposite to adjacent would be to switch from sine to cosine. And by the way, the reverse would be true, that the cosine of the complement would be equal to the sine of x. Similarly, the cosecant of pi over 2 minus x, in other words, the cosecant of the complement, well, what would that be equal to? Well, cosecant's the reciprocal of sine, so what's the reciprocal of cosine? That would be secant of x, all right? So the sine of sine and cosecant, their complements are cosine and secant. Then the last one to talk about is the tangent complement. So pi over 2 minus x, so the complement, sorry, the tangent of the complement is equal to the cotangent of x. So these three are helpful in case you see pi over 2 minus x and you want to simplify that into just a um, one term in your quantity, in your parentheses. So those are three important identities. Now the even and odd identities. Okay, so basically anything that's even is anything that has symmetry. So like a parabola has symmetry. Anything that's odd is something that doesn't. So something that's, you know, cubic, that doesn't have any symmetry. So the even functions that have symmetry about the y-axis, that would be this guy right here, which is a very rough sketch of cosine. So if you take the cosine of any negative angle value, that will be equivalent to the cosine of just that x value itself, all right? So that's even, okay? That is the only one that is like that. The other two are odd. So that means that the sine of any negative x value is equal to the opposite of that value. And same with tangent. The negative x value would be equal to the opposite of whatever tangent value at that angle. Now, please note that this is also true for the reciprocal. So secant of negative x would be equal to the opposite of the secant, or sorry, would just be equal to the positive secant of x. And then down here, this would also be true for cosecant and cotangent. They are also odd. All right. Now you're probably thinking, okay, cool, but what does any of this have to do with verifying? Why is this important? Yada, yada, yada. I get you. Well, suppose you wanted to simplify this expression. And I don't know why there is this random arrow in here. All right. Suppose you wanted to simplify this expression because we really don't want negative angle values. How can we simplify this? Well, we just learned that the sine of negative x, so here, let me, let me help visualize this for you. We just learned something about the sine of negative x, and we just learned something about the cosine. We learned that this is actually equal to the opposite of the sine of x, all right? So now there's no negative messing with my angle value. And we just learned that the cosine of an, a negative angle is actually just the positive version of that angle. I just want to go right to the sine again. Sorry about that. Well, that helps us out a lot because if I look at this expression, sine over cosine, well, I know what that equals. That is a 
identity I learned about the other day, a quotient identity, which is that the sine over the cosine is the tangent of x. So I'm going to keep that negative, but change that from sine over cosine to tangent. So that's much more simple. So now we are done. So negative tangent of x. Okay. In my second example, so by the way, what does it mean to simplify? Essentially, it means to, uh, to create or to reduce the number of terms. Reduce the number of trig terms. All right, so we want to try and get rid of as many trig values as possible. So, or trig expressions. So we had two here, and our x's were negative. Now they're positive, and we only have one trig uh, function. We're only talking about tangent now. That's more simple. Sometimes it might mean we have to factor, which is actually what we are going to have to do in number two. So we have something to the fourth power, both secant and tangent. Well, those, as we've talked about, are perfect squares still. So this is actually a difference of two squares. So we can take the secant squared x minus the tangent squared x and write the secant squared x plus tangent squared x. All right, now I'm going to give you a second to look at that, all right? All right, now one of these quantities in parentheses is a Pythagorean identity. So I just said the words Pythagorean identity, so maybe you want to look in your notes real quick or make a decision, but hopefully after I'm stalling a little bit, you notice that, which one is it? That this secant squared x minus tangent squared x is a Pythagorean identity that is equal to 1. So 1 times this quantity is going to be what we will have. So that helps because now we're down to just these two terms to deal with. But there's something else you should know. You can actually rewrite secant squared x as tangent squared of x plus 1 plus the tangent squared x. So that's all in parentheses. By the way, if you're wondering how I got that this is 1, I should probably make a little side note over here. Tangent squared x plus 1 equals secant squared. All right? I can do one small manipulation to this, and it will still be equivalent. The small manipulation that I made in my head was this. If I subtract the tangent squared, then 1 is the secant squared of x minus the tangent squared of x. All right? So this is the 1 that I replaced with the expression that's in those parentheses. So if you want to make a note about how I got that one, that might be helpful. Okay, so I also took the liberty of substituting the original Pythagorean identity, secant squared, is tangent squared x plus 1. Why did I do that? Well, now I just have tangents to deal with. So, in fact, I have two tangent squared x's, right? 1, 2, plus 1. Now, that is about as simplified as we can make this, but uh, we've only got one trig function now, and we've reduced the exponents, so that's all great. So, that would be our simplified version of secant squared, or sorry, secant, secant to the fourth of x minus tangent to the fourth of x. All right. Two more examples to talk about, and again, just a little arrow. All right, so here we have the sine of beta, the tangent of beta, multiplied together, plus cosine of beta. So at some point, hopefully earlier, we've talked about the fact that if there are too many types of trig functions, that you want to change them to sine and cosine, all right? Especially since two of these three functions already are sine and cosine. So I'm going to leave sine, but I'm going to write it as the sine of beta over one, all right? Sometimes it helps because if you're wondering why I'm thinking, okay, write that as a fraction, I'm thinking ahead to the fact that tangent of beta, that is a fraction when I rewrite it using the um, quotient identity. So tangent is sine of beta over cosine of beta. So I've rewritten this, and then I am adding the cosine of 
beta over 1. Okay? So at this point, I have two fractions that are multiplied together that I can combine. That would be sine squared beta over cosine of beta. Now, I'm about to add this other fraction. But eventually, I do want to make them one fraction. The only way to add fractions is if the denominator is the same. So currently, this denominator over here is 1, and this fraction's denominator is cosine. Well, if I multiply by the cosine of beta, now multiplying across, I would have the cosine squared beta, and the 1 in this denominator would become cosine. So now they have the same denominator, and I can add my fractions together. Uh, if you're wondering why I have to multiply the top and bottom by cosine, it's because I really have to multiply by 1. And this is one way to write the number 1. So, combining these fractions into 1 means I'm going to add the numerators together. So, sine squared beta plus cosine squared beta. And I'm going to keep the denominator the same. So, cosine of beta. Now, you should start to notice certain things. For example, when you see sine and cosine together, you should notice that that is a trig identity, specifically the Pythagorean identity. It's my personal favorite because that one just is 1, always. So sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So we've got cosine of beta is what we are equal to. All right, so we are almost at the end of our work here because ideally, while there's one trig function down here, we really don't want to write it as this reciprocal 1 over cosine. It'd be so much nicer if we didn't have this fraction. Well, there is a reciprocal identity that we can use, and it says that secant of beta is equal to the reciprocal. So, that is our final answer, the secant of beta. By the way, in case you haven't uh, thought about this, at any time, if what I'm doing, you need to pause this video, think about it, go back, listen to it again, please don't hesitate to do that. All right, the last one that we're going to look at is this tangent to the fourth x plus tangent squared x plus 1. Now, we've got three terms. Anytime you see three terms and maybe some exponents and these are the same, it is quite possible and that these two are the same type of trig function. That's what I mean by the same. It means you're probably going to need to factor. So, this would factor. If you don't see it, let's think about this. Okay, so tangent squared x and tangent squared x would be the first part of the factors, all right? Because if you break this up using multiplication, you'd need 2 here and 2 there to get 4 as your exponent. And then in order to multiply to get 1, we need to multiply 1 and 1 together. So that means that we'll get tangent to the fourth, that we'll get 1 tangent squared plus another tangent squared. Ooh, that does not factor. Which means that I made a typo. Right here, there should be a 2. Just an FYI. There should definitely be a 2 there. All right. So that explains that. That should be 2 tangent squared of x. So then we'd get tangent squared x plus 1 quantity squared. Now, why is that really helpful? Again, go back to your Pythagorean identities. This is actually equal to the secant squared of x. So if we are squaring the secant squared, we can simplify that a little bit as secant to the fourth of x. And then we are done. Now there are more examples on the next page, on page 8, and another video for that for you to watch. All right, so thank you so much for listening.